and I hear the voice of the Lord comes to me crystal clear, resounds through my being. I am going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity, the whole earth in one generation. And I remember I was overwhelmed with that. I go, what does that mean? And the fear of the Lord came upon me and I was weeping, trembling. I've never had an encounter like this awake. And I said, yes, Lord, yes. He said, many have said yes, but they've not yet done it. In June 1982, while pastoring the South St. Louis Fellowship Church, Mike Bickle introduced Augustine Akola to his congregation. Akola was a self-proclaimed prophet of questionable credentials. Bickle reminded his congregation of a passage from Matthew 10:21 where Jesus declared that anyone who receives a prophet in the name of that prophet, receives a prophet's reward. Bickle said, I am risking my whole ministry, but I endorse him as a bona fide prophet of God. Akola prophesied that God would redirect Bickle in a new direction, which Mike apparently believed to mean Kansas City. Believing that Akola was a true prophet of God, and that God had sent Akola to lead him, Bickle apparently got the notion that his ministry would have a significant impact on Christianity. He claimed that Akola was, quote, a man with a tremendous spirit of prophecy upon him, a spirit of revelation. Bickle told others that, quote, God speaks to him in very powerful ways. A few months later, in September 1982, Bickle traveled to Cairo. There, he claimed that God had spoken to him, telling him that he would be starting a movement and that it would touch the ends of the earth. Bickle returned to Kansas City and confirmed this new movement through prophetic revelation from Akola. A few weeks later, Bickle met with Akola and received an alleged prophecy from God. According to the prophecy, multitudes of young people would rally around this movement. The movement would display the full manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A false prophet would arise in his midst. And there will be those who would rise up against the movement. Why do the historical accounts of the creation of IHOP Casey fail to mention Augustine Akola? Why was he not a member of the other Kansas City prophets? What was the significance of Mike Bickle speaking to God in Cairo? To find out, we must examine one of the most fundamental doctrines in IHOP theology and its relation to the Great Pyramid of Giza. A new expression of Christianity worldwide. And he says, I'm going to change it and I'm going to do it. And it was in Cairo, Egypt, and the Spirit of the Lord was resting on me, and I've never been awake and felt the fear of the Lord, the trembling fear of the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And he says, Many have said yes, but they have not yet done it. One of the most fundamental doctrines to IHOP KC is that of Joel's army. When disgraced prophet Paul Cain of the Kansas City Prophets described his vision of the movement to Mike Bickle, Cain claimed that God had shown him a banner in the skies declaring Joel's army in training. Joel's army was a key element of the manifest sons of God doctrine that emerged from the latter rain movement. William Branham, a leading figure of that movement who strongly influenced Paul Cain, taught that shortly before the end of days, God would manifest himself through his church to fulfill a passage from Luke 17 verses 29 through 30 in the New Testament. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Branham taught that the greatest manifestation would be into a prophet, believed to be the return of Elijah from the Old Testament. According to Branham, this Elijah figure would be God, himself. Many of Branham's followers, including Cain, believed Branham to be that Elijah. Some of his followers, including Tommy Osborne, openly declared that Branham was God in the flesh. This unusual doctrine about an elite group of people manifested with either the power of God or becoming a supreme deity was made possible due to the group's belief in British Israelism. According to the British Israel belief, the peoples of the United States and Canada were the direct descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. As such, any passages from the Old Testament written to the ancient children of Israel could be interpreted with dual meaning, the full passage could be applied to the ancient world, while certain aspects of each passage could be applied to the modern world. 
Latter rain prophets and apostles were selected to determine how to apply the duly purposed scriptures. The most significant of which was from the book of Joel in the Old Testament, which described the symbolic meaning of spring and fall rains in the ancient world. By the time the latter rain movement had begun, British Israelism had transitioned to the more radical Christian identity movement. Christian identity converts praised the formation of the nation of Israel because they believed the true children of Israel would one day gather on the Temple Mount. They believed that the Jews of the era were so-called false Jews who had invaded several of the NAR Seven Mountain areas, from business and entertainment to government. When this mixed with latter rain, prophets and apostles of the movement began claiming that the army of bugs in Joel's prophecy referred to an elite group of Christians in the modern era. They began to refer to themselves as Joel's army and introduce doctrines furthering the Jewish conspiracy propaganda from the Christian identity movement's foundational text. The anti-Semitic protocols of the learned elders of Zion, a propaganda document claiming to have identified a secret plot by Jews to conquer the world. The other foundational document, though many people today might not view it as such, was near Cairo. Christian identity leaders further radicalized the British-Israel belief that the Great Pyramid of Giza was a prophetic document, written in stone, with prophetic measurements that should be interpreted as time markers for significant events leading to the end of days. For Christian identity converts, this location near Cairo was spiritually significant. Leaders of the movement claimed that the pyramid was built by the biblical Enoch from the Old Testament as the Second Bible. How many of you have ever heard of the seven wonders of the world? Ancient wonders of the world. One of the ones that is most commonly known of is the Pyramid of Giza. Now many people when they hear this or talked about, they think, oh my gosh, because so much of the I occult believe world, the Egyptians built the Pyramid of Giza. You know who be, I believe with all of my heart built it? Enoch. Enoch, the one who walked with God, the seventh from Adam? By the 1960s, the notion that the biblical Enoch built the Great Pyramid of Giza was widely popular among Christian identity leaders. In Christian identity doctrine, the Aryan race had descended from the good bloodline, while the Egyptians had descended from a so-called bad bloodline. Christian identity believed that the bad bloodline could not be mixed with the good, and that white-skinned people pre-existed the dark-skinned people in Egypt. Therefore, those of the so-called good bloodline who married people from that region could still have preserved the good bloodline. Clan leader and one of the fathers of Christian identity, Wesley Swift, summarized this history in his 1961 sermon, Races of the Earth and Their Differences. Now, if you think the flood covered all the earth, remember the Egyptians were in Egypt, they built, uh, they built monuments and tombs, and, and Enoch and Job built the uh, tremendous pyramid of Giza and the Temple of Baal before the flood. Remember that after, long after the flood, when Abraham's descendants went into Egypt, and Jacob and his sons following Joseph, the Egyptians were still in Egypt, and Joseph was to marry the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, and whose two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were to become the fathers of anglo saxonism in time and history and culture. A few months later in 1962, William Branham preached his most famous Manifest Sons of God sermon entitled, The Stature of the Perfect Man, wherein Branham described his spiritual pyramid of doctrine, combined with a dispensational pyramid of church age messengers, sealed by the pyramid capstone, which he claimed to be Jesus. Not only did Branham teach Wesley Swift's version of the two bloodlines, but Branham also taught the Christian identity theology about Enoch building the Giza Pyramid, just outside Cairo. It is without question that Paul Cain would have transferred this knowledge to Mike Bickle. Cain was one of Branham's most devout followers and continued to spread Branham's manifest sons of God doctrines until his death in 2019. So the other thing I'm, I'm thinking of in September of 2021, Chris Reed gave a word um, about our 40 year transition. And I, I remember in that time frame, it, it's like something went off in me related to that 40th tra year transition. And 
uh, one of the things he spoke of is a transfer and it's a generational transfer and I, I feel like transfer and I'm thinking of our children I'm thinking of the generation behind us you know uh, the heart standards that we would carry as a people that he spoke in Cairo after Mike Bickle's alleged supernatural experience in Cairo things began to change very quickly in the ministry that would eventually lead to the formation of IHOP KC. The so-called Prophet Augustine Akola, who was fundamental to the creation of the new movement, was cast out of the church as an apostate whose attempts at prophecy were often failures. It was rumored that Akola was homosexual, which most people in the movement viewed as a sexual crime against God. Bickle formed new strategic partnerships in the NAR Apostolic Network to affirm his Cairo experience. One of those partnerships was with Chris Reed, who followed Branham so closely that he used Branham's sermon titles when preaching from them, often quoting Branham verbatim and presenting slides much like those drawn by Branham himself. It was but one of many tools of manipulation used among the group to lead people to believe that Bickle was to be a NAR apostle to lead Joel's army. How did IHOP KC manage to distract its members from the false prophets that were instrumental to its formation? How did the other so-called Kansas City prophets help Mike Bickle rise to become an apostle of the NAR? To find out, we must first examine the concept of churches falling under Bickle's so-called mantle and where that mantle allegedly came from.